Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. And we start with question number one from Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to address reports that rail travellers on the Fife Circle face pure journey experiences and that there are constant failures of service. Minister Hamza Youssef. I completely understand the frustration that poor performance can have on the customer experience and do recognise, of course, that ScotRail has faced a number of challenges, uh, particularly in the recent months of autumn uh, and winter, which I fully expect to be addressed immediately. That is why Alex Hines, the MD of ScotRail Alliance, has instigated an independent review being taken forward by Nick Donovan as part of ScotRail's recovery measures, which is something I very much welcome. The sooner the performance challenges are addressed, the sooner, of course, passengers can enjoy the level of service they desire, but quite rightly, they deserve. Uh, my officials at Transport Scotland continue to closely monitor and challenge ScotRail's performance and will work with them as they develop and implement the actions to improve performance over the coming months. Alec Rowley. I um, uh, thank the Minister for that answer and I'm pleased that he understands the frustration. I'm sure he can imagine the frustration. You're standing waiting on your train coming and the train goes right past. You're left there waiting an hour trying to get to your work. People are being late for their work. The Femlin Press have launched a campaign, Crush Hour. The name speaks for itself, but you know, masses upon masses of rail users in Fife are horrified at the kind of service that they're getting. Will the Minister agree to meet with me so that we can go through the detail of all these problems? I think you know, people have been patient, they've waited long enough, we need action. And will he consider taking the railways back into public ownership so that the profits can be invested in the railways and we can address these unacceptable situations that are happening within the Fife Circle Rail Route? Minister. Uh, can I thank uh, Alex Rowley uh, for that? Uh, and he understood from my answer that I, sim I wasn't con uh, dismissing at all, of course, the concerns. I uh, completely understand them. Uh, and I have been keeping up with Dunfermline Press's uh, uh, coverage uh, very much uh, on this. What I would do is try to wrap some context around this, which is uh, in the early part of 2017, uh, and indeed for most of 2017 until the autumn months, uh, the, there was a significant improvement in, in Fife Rail Services, running at about 93, 94 uh, percent, but clearly in the autumn months, uh, they, they have not coped well, hence the reason uh, for the independent review. I can also say uh, that many MSPs from across the chamber uh, who represent Fife and the surrounding areas uh, have contacted me, Shirley Ann Somerville, uh, Annabel Ewing, uh, Jerry Go Ruth, uh, and Liz Smith uh, as well. So I know that there are a number of uh, MSPs, as I say, from Fife that have raised that. Uh, I've spoken to Alex Hines this morning about this issue and others. Uh, I'm more than happy for my office to facilitate a, a meeting with those MSPs and others from Fife that might have an interest in real service and real performance with Alex Hines. Uh, of course, I'd be more than happy to meet the, the, the MSP as well individually, but I think, uh, of course, this is a matter uh, for ScotRail, so therefore meeting with the MD uh, would be the appropriate uh, measure. So I will, uh, my office will facilitate that meeting uh, if it is helpful. Uh, clearly, uh, there will be an upgrade, as, as the member probably knows, in the rolling stock at later in 2018, early 2019. But people in Fife should not uh, wait for that until they get an improvement in their service. So the, the immediate uh, priority is getting that improvement uh, in performance. In terms of his very last point, uh, I understand his uh, ideological position. I would just gently remind him, of course, as the SNP government that has allowed a public sector bidder to bid for the railways for the first time, something that was denied uh, by successive Labour governments in Westminster. <coughs> Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Um, the issue of stop skipping that we're discussing here is a problematic one because stop, stop skipping is only treated as a partial cancellation and therefore there are no financial penalties uh, resulting from that. Does the Minister agree that in the new franchise that will come forward that stop skipping needs to be identified, there needs to be financial penalties um, applied to that? I would just reiterate, of course, that when, when stops are skipped, that it does count uh, as a PPM failure and, of course, uh, ScotRail are held to account for their PPM uh, failures and when it comes to financial fines the squire regime which is the auditing regime is probably the best audited, uh, auditing regime of any railway in the entire United Kingdom and that has been borne out by the fact uh, that ScotRail has been fined quite substantially uh, when they failed to meet uh, the very high criteria uh, that we set them but his point is one that I will certainly reflect on uh, when it comes to future franchises of course but before getting to that end point uh, of the franchise, uh, we should be, uh, of course, uh, continuing that dialogue with ScotRail to minimise what is a, a practice which is unhelpful. And I should say, when I became Transport Minister, uh, I did say to ScotRail that I expect them to minimise 
the skipping of stops during the peak hours uh, in particular. Uh, that has happened, but I would go back to my answer to Alex Rowley that in the autumn months and winter months have clearly been challenging for ScotRail, uh, and that is unwelcome. Question number two, Gail Ross. Thank you. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is made towards Scotland becoming a good food nation. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewan. Uh, President Officer, our plans for Scotland to become a good food nation are continuing. The Scottish Food Commission have recently submitted their recommendations for the Good Food Nation Bill, and these recommendations are currently being considered across Scottish Government with a view to consulting uh, this year. The consultation will inform the content of a Good Food Nation Bill for introduction during the term of this Parliament. Gail Ross. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I have stated in this chamber recently that this piece of legislation has the potential to be one of the most exciting and important this Parliament will pass. Given the number of other sectors this bill will cover and the amount of interest there is likely to be, can the Cabinet Secretary outline how long the consultation process will be, when it will commence and how we make sure everyone, not just stakeholders and industry experts, get a chance to respond? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I can confirm that the consultation will be launched uh, later this year, that it will be for, open for a period of 12 weeks. We are currently investigating the ways in which we can inform the public about this. This is a slightly different type of piece of legislation uh, than the norm, presiding officer, and I aim to seek to get the maximum involvement, as Gail Ross rightly uh, suggests. So we fully recognise the importance uh, of involving as many as people uh, many people as possible in the promotion of Scotland as a good food nation. Edward Mountain. Thank you, presiding officer. Given the funding for the food and drink strategy has remained unchanged at £5 million a year since 2014, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm if funding to support the proposed new good food bill nation will come from this allocation or whether separate funds will be found to fund it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm sorry the Tories so seek to introduce this sort of monetary note because, you see, the promotion of a good food nation is about how we carry ourselves. It's about how we promote ourselves. It's about promoting good nutrition. It's about attracting more people to Scotland to enjoy the high quality of our natural larder. It's about encouraging young people to learn how to prepare food. It's not all about money, and I hope at some point the Conservatives will get it. <laughs> Question number three, Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government how schools identify and support children with mental health problems. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, education authorities and all those working in our schools have a responsibility to identify, support and develop the mental well-being of pupils with decisions on how to provide that support taken on the basis of local circumstances and needs. Every child and young person should have access to emotional and mental well-being support in school. Some will provide access to school-based counselling, while others will be supported by pastoral care staff and liaison with the education psycho psychological services, family and health services for special support when required. A mental health link is, a person is available to every school, and this has been achieved in a variety of ways using various models working to meet local needs. As part of the government's mental health strategy, we are undertaking a national review of how personal and social education is being delivered in school the review includes an assessment of how the teaching of mental well-being is delivered. That review will be completed by the end of this calendar year. Mary Fee. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the findings of a Sam H survey of teachers that showed two-thirds feel they had insufficient training in mental health to allow them to carry out their role, and that 73% of the teachers surveyed had low levels of confidence in their resources to respond to a pupil raising concerns about mental health. Based on these results, will the Scottish Government commit to ensuring that teachers receive adequate training and on a continual basis? And will the Cabinet Secretary commend North Ayrshire Council for leading the way in offering pupils access to mental health counselling after starting a new counselling service across its secondary schools? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, the, 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 the approach taken by uh, North Ayrshire Council is a very welcome process, and uh, I, I would expect that to be reflected in a variety of ways around the country in different local authorities. It won't be identically delivered in other parts of the country because other local authorities will have um, considered how best to meet the needs of young people um, as effectively as they can. 
Uh, I'm very much aware of the findings of the SAMI survey. We take those findings seriously. Um, it's why uh, these issues must be reflected upon by our initial teacher education providers um, and also be a feature of the continuous professional development of the teaching profession, uh, recognising the significance of these issues. Um, finally, I'd say to Mary Fee that in, uh, you know, on a weekly basis I am in and out of the schools of Scotland. I was in a school this morning before I came to Parliament and I see very good work being undertaken to focus on addressing the mental well-being of young people. And of course, health and well-being is one of the three fundamental aspects of curriculum for excellence that were part of the Chief Inspector's guidance to education in August 2016 that must form a part of the curriculum delivery in, in, areas, in all areas of Scotland. Question number four, Ruth McGuire. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how the proposals in its draft strategy to tackle loneliness and social isolation could help promote the third sector. Minister Jean Freeman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In our draft strategy, we are clear that third sector organisations have an important role to play in reducing social isolation and loneliness. And to support that, we have protected the core third sector budget at 2016-17 levels. Volunteers, of course, are central to this effective work. And in 2016-17, our investment in the Volunteer Support Fund resulted in 3,505 new volunteers uh, being recruited from disadvantaged backgrounds. But engaging people with this experience and those who are older remains a challenge. And so our commitment of 3.8 million through to that fund from 2017 onwards is important. That's why, because we want to do more and we have made our commitment clear with that investment, our strategy focuses on community-led work, what more needs to be done and what we as a government can do to enable those community-led initiatives to flourish. Ruth McGuire. I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister will agree with me that there are already many examples of great things being done by the third sector to tackle loneliness and social isolation. My own constituents in Stevenson, for example, have benefited from working with Centre Stage and Raise Your Voice Idea, our dear, bringing people together with musical memories, family nights and with their theme of fun, food and folk. Can I ask the Minister what the Scottish Government is doing to encourage organisations such as Centre Stage and Raise Your Voice, our dear, to respond to the consultation to ensure that existing best practice is learned from and taken into account as the strategy is developed. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, Minister. Sorry. Thank you. Um, of course, as a, a neighbouring uh, MSP in, or as an MSP in a neighbouring constituency, I am of course very well aware of uh, much of the work that centre stage uh, undertake in my own uh, area in Cumnock with the Robertson Trust. They developed work uh, with women in particular around that area and now have a very uh, successful heart and soul initiative including a community cafe. The, the organisation and others that members uh, spoke about in last week's debate, the key characteristic of them is that they are rooted in and led by the communities that they work in, which of course is central to our strategy. Um, we have encouraged third sector interfaces in each local authority area to circulate information through their networks about how to respond and encourage that uh, responses to us. We are also hosting a number of engagement events across Scotland over the coming weeks and months in order to encourage uh, response to our consultation and uh, for me and my uh, officials to hear directly about some of the work uh, that is done but also what more needs to be done and I look forward to hearing from Centre Stage, Robertson Trust, Age Scotland and a myriad of organisations and people in their local communities uh, about how our strategy can be improved. And of course, we will do all we can to encourage their participation. Annie Wells. As alluded to in my speech on loneliness and social isolation last week, I am pleased that social prescribing will form part of the strategy. How does the Scottish Government intend to monitor and select pilot projects in local communities that can be recommended as models to be used elsewhere? Minister. Um, I, I welcome as well support for uh, that element of our strategy and indeed last week uh, for the strategy as a whole. Um, Part of our consultation, of course, includes uh, organisations giving us their views on these matters, and we will return to this chamber and to the parliament with our final strategy and our proposition on how we take some of those issues forward in some detail. And Mark Griffin. 
Thank you, President Officer. The, the Minister will be aware that the Government's budget proposes cuts which will affect the third sector's ability to help communities be more sustainable and tackle loneliness. It's surely a real terms cut of 0.4 million to central third sector funding, a 4.4 million pound real terms cut to regeneration programmes and more cuts to local government undermines the good intention of the loneliness strategy that we all support. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Minister. I always find it very sad when colleagues in this chamber refuse to hear what is being said by ministers or indeed to read documents that are there for them to read. Can I repeat? We have protected the third sector budget. The equalities budget is up. And as I said in last week's debate, it is ill behoves my colleagues across this chamber to misrepresent not only what this government has in its draft budget, but what our colleagues in SPICE confirm is in that draft budget. I'm sure, if they are ready, members from the Labour benches, if they yet have their proposals for the budget, my colleague uh, the Finance Secretary would be more than happy to discuss any constructive proposals they may have. Question five, Joe McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact of Erasmus Plus scheme on the third sector, the further education sector and youth work in Scotland. Minister Shirley Ann Somerville. Erasmus Plus receives ongoing evaluations which are undertaken by the projects and a full impact assessment report is not due until 2020. However, feedback from stakeholders and projects illustrates the difference that these initiatives are making. The Erasmus Plus programme has played a significant role in broadening the educational experience, developing cu cultural awareness and increasing the employment prospects for Scottish young people. Since 2014, more than 15,000 people have been involved in nearly 500 Erasmus Plus projects across Scotland. The flow of people to and from Scotland supports the development of the skills, experience and global outlook necessary for Scotland's society and economy to thrive. John McAlvine. I thank the Minister for that answer. Two weeks ago, the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee heard firsthand of the benefits of Erasmus+, Plus, not just to university exchange, but to young volunteers, apprentices and further education students. Will she join me in backing the Keep Erasmus Plus campaign led by Youth Link Scotland, Leonard Cheshire Disability Scotland and others, and call on the UK Government to ensure that this vital scheme is not destroyed by Brexit? Minister. Well, the Scottish Government is absolutely clear on the value of Erasmus Plus and the risks that are posed to it by Brexit. So yes, I do heartily support the campaign that the member has mentioned. As I said in my original answer, the programme has played a significant role in broadening the educational experience, the cultural awareness and increasing employment prospects. And as Ms McAlpine rightly points out, that's not just to university students. In fact, often the young people who are furthest away from higher education benefit the most as they have been allowed to take part in international exchanges that they might not have been otherwise able to do. Brexit and indeed the loss of membership of the single market, the freedom of movement, threatens all of that. So this government will do all it can to ensure that it protects Scotland's young people from the worst effects of the hard Brexit continuing to be pursued by the UK government. Question number six, Adam Tompkins. Presenting officer, to ask the Scottish Government what support it is giving to the Holocaust Educational Trust. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, we must never forget the Holocaust and those who continue to suffer because of genocide and intolerance, racism and bigotry. Since 2009, the Scottish Government has provided the Holocaust Education Trust with funding for the Lessons from Auschwitz project. In 2009, this funding began with £214,000 per year and has since risen to £296,000 per year, a total of £2.25 million over the period. The funding illustrates the Government's commitment to providing opportunities for Scotland's young people to develop as responsible citizens a key element of our curriculum. To date, the project has reached over 68% of Scotland's schools, with 3,200 Scottish students having participated in the project, along with 500 teachers. Adam Tolkent. I thank the Deputy First Minister for that answer. The Holocaust Educational Trust plays a leading role in promoting Holocaust Memorial Day, which is on Saturday, and which I know Bill Kidd has a question about in FMQs in a few moments. Holocaust Memorial Day falls on the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, which I know the Deputy First Minister visited uh, with Scottish schoolchildren uh, recently. Presiding officer, it was my honour to open our Parliament's annual Holocaust Memorial debate earlier this month, uh, which this year focused on the theme of the power of words. 
Will the Scottish Government stand with me and with every member of this Parliament who spoke in that debate in pledging itself to remember the unique horror of the Holocaust and to thank the, Hol the Holocaust Educational Trust for its invaluable work in ensuring that we will never forget? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I agree unreservedly with the remarks made by uh, Mr Tompkins in his question. Uh, the uh, events of the Holocaust uh, must be forgotten by nobody. And as we look at the troubled and uncertain world in which we live in today, there is even more requirement for people to be reminded of the horror of the Holocaust. As Mr Tompkins says, I accompanied Scottish school pupils to Auschwitz and Birkenau in November. Um, having extensively studied the, this period of modern history, it, nothing prepared me for what I witnessed. Nothing. And uh, I think the experience for our young people, of whom I was enormously proud, uh, much younger than me, but able to handle with great dignity and care and understanding the events of that trip, uh, indicated to me that the investment we make in the work of the Holocaust Educational Trust is vital to ensuring that we sustain that understanding amongst our young people and their appreciation of uh, these terrible events. The First Minister represented the government at uh, a, Holocaust educational, uh, a Holocaust Memorial Day event last night in the city of Glasgow, uh, which was um, run by our schools and was another fine tribute to the excellence that exists within Scottish education and the deep understanding of the significance and the horror of the events that Mr Tompkins raises in Parliament today. Thank you very much. That concludes general questions. Before we turn to First Minister's questions, can I welcome to the gallery Dr. Meher Taj Rawani, the Deputy Speaker of the Pakistan Provincial Assembly of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa.